Good to see you here. You've come to the right place because, uh, you know, this is all about businesses and, and about financial inclusion for businesses. And for those that um, are concerned about finance and finance technology, we, we have to remember that at best, finance is like the, the lubricant, the oil. If you don't have a machine and the machine can't run, it really doesn't take you very far. And SMEs are the, are the machine of all the economies in this region and beyond. We have a great panel from across Asia to talk about SME growth and how, the whole, how technology and digitalization can help SMEs to grow, but also what some of the remaining obstacles are and how we can, how we can deal with those. I'm Matt Gamzer. I work at the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, and I run something called the SME Finance Forum, a G20 and, uh, and World Bank initiative to help uh, people around the world get together and learn how to finance SMEs better. So I'm going to let my, my very distinguished panel briefly introduce themselves, and then we're going to dive straight into this issue. So let me turn to you, please, Nitin. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls. Uh, this is Nitin Sethi. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Adani Group, uh, India's largest conglomerate. Uh, I'm also the founding leader for uh, Adani Digital Labs. Uh, at Adani Digital Labs, we are uh, digitally transform all the consumer-facing businesses for Adani, and we are working on an integrated platform called Adani One. In my previous lives, I've, I was uh, the chief digital officer for uh, India's largest airline, and close to 20 years, I've worked for uh, Indian startups, uh, startups like 99 Acres, Nokri, uh, Shiksha, uh, Yatra, uh, so many in different segments, uh, from job market to travel, uh, OTA, uh, from uh, property to matrimony. So uh, what I know, my two cents are that no economy is great other than the enablement of SMEs. So really looking forward to learning. Well, we look forward to going from property to matrimony and beyond with you. <laughs> Thank you, Nitin. Ozir, over to you. Yes, my name is Ozir Khan. I work for Asian Development Bank based out of Manila. I run the digital side of the house and uh, support the institution working with SME. I also support private sector operations and our sovereign operations. Um, I've been involved in all the digital work recently at ADB, including um, this emerging tech around AI and now Web 3.0 coming into place, trying to connect the dots between new tech and SMEs. Before that, I was with the UN in New York and pretty much in the same area uh, in, in technology and how it plays a role in development. Thank you. That's great, Ozir, and we really look forward to picking your brain about what you're seeing across the whole large ADB footprint in particular. Now over to Sandeep. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sandeep Malhotra. I run products and innovation for MasterCard in Asia Pacific. Uh, and, and what does that mean? So we, we work on, used to work on cards, right? So now we've renamed these cards to credentials. So if you want to do payments from a card, a debit card, a credit card, or a prepaid card, we'll make that happen. But if you want to make a payment from a bank account or even a wallet account, whether it could be a crypto account, we'll make that happen too. So we call them credentials. So we make sure that these credentials work, whether you dip the credential or your device, whether you scan them, whether you tap them, or whether you click on them, we will make sure that that happens in a safe, simple, and a smart fashion. Uh, and pleasure to be here. Great, so we look forward to hearing more about how moving from being a plastic card company to being a true digital transaction company is, is uh, affecting the SME growth story and options. We'll come back to you on that, Sandeep. And last but certainly not least, Shinjini from, and it, it says Five Salts, limited on there, which is, I guess, the official company name, but it's really SALT, right? Yes. So hi, I'm Shinjini, and uh, I'm co-founder of an app that has just been launched a week ago in India. It's called SALT, and SALT because we are a fintech platform primarily built for women. So we have designed it for women. We are going to sell it to women. If men come on their own, they are welcome, but we want to reverse the gender ratio in finance. And that motivation came to me primarily, me and my co-founders, primarily because we, we all, all three of us come from um, 
financial services and fintech background. And we realized that just because finance was transforming from traditional brick and mortar to digital, it wasn't necessarily becoming more inclusive. So to make it more inclusive required specific interventions, and those interventions could be around design primarily, but also around distribution and solving other psycholo psychology and uh, issues. So that's what we are building at SALT. Before this, for 30 years, I've been in India's financial services. I've been a regulator. I've been a, I used to head Citibank's consumer bank for India right before this. And I, for since most people will know this, I'm still on the board of Paytm Payments Bank. I used to be its CEO at one point of time. Um, I'm also on executive council of CGAP. So my my perspective on finance and uh, small and small businesses and inclusion are formed from a multiplicity of perspective over a very long period of time. So happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Th thanks so much. And thanks for, for reminding us about a topic we're going to take up in detail in this panel too, the, which is this gender digital divide. Because uh, for those of you that, that monitor the Findex report, which comes out about every four or five years from the World Bank, the good news is that there are a lot more people, hundreds of millions, that now have access to accounts. And, and that's the good news. The bad news is the differential between the percentage of men that are included and the percentage of women that is included has not changed. So despite whatever we've done digitally so far, which has helped in general, it has not addressed the gender divide. So we're going to go back into that. And particularly because women entrepreneurs are a good portion of the world's entrepreneurs. And if we can't have them grow, we're not dealing with the SME growth story. But let's, and by, by, by the way, just to remind you what you were instructed by our MC, please use Slido at any time, make some questions. We'll try to take it as, as many as we can. We already have one on the board here, so just somebody's been really ambitious, and we will take that one up, but uh, please keep them coming, and I, I will look to them and get as many included as I can. Let, let's, um, let's dive straight in, maybe going back all the way over to you, Shinjini. So what are you finding are some of the keys to getting SMEs more into a digital footprint and so that they can have a place in the new increasingly digital, not only financing world, but commerce world? So, so thank you for asking me that question. I know that we are competing with uh, very interesting panels everywhere, so I'm going to make this very interesting. So I get asked this question a lot about, um, uh, you know, about whether technology is something that people are able to learn by themselves and therefore whether proliferation of technology to the segment of population that we are talking about, which is right at the bottom of the uh, commerce pyramid in this case, uh, gender, uh, you know, uh, women who are poor in, in my case, uh, whether they will be able to adapt to this technology. Uh, and my answer always is that when, in our households, for example, where we have help and we have a husband, if I buy a washing machine or a microwave, my help learns it before my husband ever does. Any, any appliance, that's the truth. So technologies have this very powerful thing that if they solve a problem, people learn how to use it. So I was an, in Paytm when demonetization happened. And when demonetization happened, suddenly cash was taken out of the system. So for those of you who, who are not aware of it, um, the India demonetized uh, currency notes of high value uh, in 2016. And uh, so people were suddenly left with uh, not having enough money to do transactions. And um, we, we would get a lot of requests from people to solve for this problem. But what we learned in that phase is how people were able to take an app which was not necessarily built to handle the type of transactions that suddenly started to happen on, on the app, but people were able to make the app uh, work for themselves. So they found different hacks. So we would see people were printing QR codes and putting it in their shops. And in fact, that learning was very interesting for us. So when you put a, put a product in the hands of people that is usable, that is stable, that is reliable, and that solves a problem in their lives, people learn how to use it. So, I think when we build for SMEs or small businesses, or in my case, uh, solopreneurs, because a lot of women tend to work from home and that's the kind of economic activity that they are engaged in, it's very important for us to design our products with that user in mind. And if we do that, then I think users do take it up and teach us how, what they are doing with our, uh, with our product and how so, we can So you're suggesting that. That, that appreciating technology isn't really the obstacle. It's actually that the technology if it's designed with the user in mind, is, is, 
is, is going to be adopted. And, we've, and you're citing very many examples of that. I mean, that, that makes me think of, you know, sort of the evolution of MasterCard that you were describing, Sandeep, because when MasterCard was just a plastic card and point of sale device company, you know, a lot of SMEs, it wasn't that they couldn't understand that, it's that that was a pain in the neck to put in place, right? I mean, and, and, you, and may, in many cases you needed a different device for every bank you were dealing with or a different device for every, I don't want to name competitors, but you know, there are lots of credit card companies out there in the world. And, and now, now you're, tell us about how the, the evolution into a multi-channel, multi multi-option is, is affecting the way that SMEs can get on board. And what is MasterCard trying to do to help accelerate this process. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, SME is not that far from a consumer, if you look at a consumer, and that's what we've generally done. You know, if you look at the payment networks, they've generally solved for one use case, P2M, buying goods and services from a merchant. And, and when you look at, look at the SME, they are also a buyer of services, and they also are a supplier of service. So not too far compared to a large corporate. So we said, okay, how about we look into the challenges which an SME will face, which are different than the consumer. So number one is they want to pay to their suppliers. They want to get paid by their buyers. They want to get digital post the pandemic era and it's going to continue. And they want to get access to capital. And, and what do we do around that is when you do a payment to a supplier, you want some electronic form because it needs to go digital. If you do cash, you know, it gets complicated and there's leakage and all that. So how do we do that? And the more new forms of that, are, yes, you could do debit card and credit card, but no, not everybody gets that. In its new incarnation, we've created a buy now, pay later instrument, which is basically better cash flow management for the, for the SME. So if you provide a buy now, pay later instrument, it's like a soft credit for the ones who do not have the capability when they do a good repayment or they show a good behavior, it becomes part of the formal credit or access to the credit which they did not have before. So, so that's the way of paying. You want to get paid an SME in different forms, whether you accept a QR code, whether you accept like electronic transfer in ACH, whether you accept cards, or you accept other forms basically of TAP where you could actually don't need to buy these expensive $400 terminals anymore We've created a technology where you can actually just bring in your phone and that becomes an acceptance device. So, of this, so this is getting at one of the questions that actually just came in about, uh, you know, the questioner was saying, oh, isn't technology always too expensive for SMEs? And you're saying that actually with the, the latest iterations, we, the, if the SME already has a smartphone, there may be no hardware costs at all. It's, a, no. it's more a matter of how do you plug in to these available solutions and, and the, the actual capital cost, if you will, it, it's a diff, maybe a different sort of cost. Yeah. I mean, the four hundred dollar terminal has become a thirty dollar. You know, your own device. So you don't need to be a very sophisticated, you know, technology user for that. And you can do cash management, inventory management, and you know, charge back and everything possible within that. Because move from a hardware utility to a more software as a service. And then you get into things like how do you get digital? And it's imperative post the pandemic that. In order to have your own identity, you can't just be a physical store. You need to have an online presence. It just is a given. The big challenge is skill set, access to technology. Uh, how do you do that? So that's where we try to make it simple in terms of how do you get digital in terms of having a storefront, which is digital in nature. It may not let you do all kind of you know, payment and fulfillment, but at least you can see the catalog. You should be able to order, and then you come and pick up in the store. Uh, so that's uh, the other part. And then the last one, which is more important, is how do you get access to capital? And that's where data comes in. So, so if you go back, and I don't distinguish between developed economies and developed economies because there are credit bureaus, but advanced setups. So if you look at what India has done, in the case of India, the Indian government has created a national identity system, which is biometric-based, called Aadhaar. So everybody and billion-plus people have access to that. They have done financial inclusion in terms of everybody gets a bank account, so they get a part of the formal banking system. And they've created digital you know, imperative with this demonetization, everybody learned digital. What is still exists is a credit gap. The access to credit gap is very large, and if you quantify it, $400 billion of 
of credit gap with respect to the SMEs. So how do you solve for that? The way you solve for that is that you take, first you go digital, so there is a digital footprint, so there is more data. There's financial data, there is data about taxes, there is data from telco, there is data from you know, your other activities like bank account, account receivable and account payable, and when you combine that, that gets you access to credit. So you can actually provide this public-private partnership where the private entities will analyze the data, apply models to the data, and do a credit scoring in absence of a credit bureau, and you extend credit. And then you credit access, extend credit in such a fashion that you have lower delinquency just because you saw better account receivables coming in, or you saw better account balances in the account. So that's one of the things we're trying to do, and this, it's, it's really growing. It's like great, it's growing. and of course, in places like Singapore and India, the government's really an active partner in this, creating that infrastructure you're describing to make the data more universally available, if you will. You know, the audience seems to have done some research on our members, because some of these questions are straight out of what I'd already prepared to ask our members, and one of them is, in addition to what governments can do for common in infrastructure, the many SMEs, in fact, many of the SMEs that have the greatest potential to grow and thrive are ones that create market linkages with larger companies. You know, Nitin, tell us more about what role, this is a question from the audience, yeah. too, what role can larger companies play in helping SMEs to grow and thrive and be more a part of this, this new age? Sure, so uh, thank you, Matt, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, so one, I would like to keep the audience on the same page, uh, highlighting three data points. So 15 trillion has been added to Apex economy by SMEs in uh, 2021. Uh, from a contribution to any economy, emerging economy, close to 49 to 50%, that is the contribution of the SMEs. From any corporate, and specifically because I have a, I, I work at Adani, so I can tell you more about what a large corporate and being largest in India, what we do. We have close to 30,000 SMEs working with us, small and bigs and category to category it differs. And whether it's an uh, acceleration program, whether it's uh, giving an opportunity to a smaller company which is not fitting your procurement criteria, uh, but you're still being fair. And most of our new age companies, including the setup which I run, Adani Digital Labs, we specifically choose startups and SMEs for our strategic partnerships to accelerate the growth. Uh, India to being very specific, India is all about, for 1.4 billion people, we are close to 80% businesses are SME businesses. 90% mm -hmm. of those businesses comes from tier two, tier three towns. There is a very, very thin line between India and Bharat and the growth of the economy comes from the Bharat, right? Which is the tier two, tier three aspirational towns. And of course, uh, my dear friend from Paytm and Citibank can echo this. Uh, but what Sandeep said is very profound that right now the technology is not the differentiator. Technology is only the enabler. A program like UPI or Aadhaar uh, is there so and COVID played the equalizer game so when you actually need to work with a corporate right now whether it's a big company or a small company there is no differentiation till the time you're solving that use case you're solving that problem for the customer and you have that edge whether you are a small player SME or a startup as a corporate as a leader I really care about my customer so if you can solve that problem in a best possible way uh, there is a huge gateway and opportunity. Okay, but let me ask a devil's advocate question here. So, so here I'm a small company and I'm supplying Adani with something and I'm really happy about that. But in the long run, I don't want to be completely dependent on Adani. Is the data that's being generated from my relationship with Adani, is that available to the rest of the market or under the India system, or, or is that proprietary to Adani, so if I want to go to another corporate and also offer them services, do I have to start from zero? So we, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not, a, not even a one billion question, it's a one trillion question. So, uh, and let me try to uh, be very honest and s simplify it. Uh, so let's say that 
you are a supplier and you do laptop machine supply to us in COVID times and you've done it better than most of people. We work with close to 50K partners in our ecosystem. And we do have a mechanism that we recommend our partners to our extended partners, right? So suppliers to our extended partners. And that's a very, very regular exercise because as a testimony that we don't shy away from giving you a testimonial or a pat on the back and also recommend to our extended ecosystem for the jobs, you can do it for them. So it's just not about serving us, it's also about creating a better inclusive ecosystem. I'll, I'll give you a use case example. We are the largest airport operator in India. We operate seven airports in India. That, that means that every fourth traveler fly from one of the Adani airports. 85 million consumers fly from air airports. Most people, when they look at airports, they feel that it's only the big brands game. Actually, it's not. It's a very localized game. Airports are gateway to cities, right? So the local flavor, whether it's souvenir, whether it's a local sweet, whether it's a local brand, so those brands get exposure through that ecosystem. So if you are doing great at one airport, you get extended to other airports and then also can supply to our partners. And even non-Adani airports? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what I'm driving at. I mean, and I want to bring in Ozir here because I'll get back to you in a second, but you know, you're working across the whole region. And, and we talked about two very interesting examples of India and, and, and Singapore where there's a lot of infrastructure that's been created where data is relatively accessible and relatively shareable. But where you're living in the Philippines at ADB's headquarters, there isn't even a national individual ID, much less a corporate ID, right? And there are many countries that are even behind the Philippines in having digitalized data, much less making it available in a sensible way. How are you approaching this as ADB to try to support an environment that, can, that SMEs can have a chance in where they can move into this digital space and have, have that footprint they create be as useful as possible? What, yeah. Yes, uh, you know, I, I, I'm personally, or I have been wrestling with this for the past uh, 15, 20 years, my work at the UN and now, now with ADB. When digital revolution came in, we all saw the opportunity. Okay, now big business, and small business will have equal opportunities in digital. Um, that came, and along with that came this world of platforms. And when the world of platform came, it didn't treat SMEs equally. And there was this access and divide that started happening, which was counterintuitive at that time, because I was trying to figure out how, how I can bring these platforms to support uh, SMEs. And issues started appearing like identity, like um, access, so on and so forth. Today where we stand, I think the answer is what you were just discussing. The answer lies in data. I think what you were just discussing is the key with Web 3.0 principles on data, where you have your data and you can keep it and share it. I think that shift is like disrupting the disruptors of the platform economy. And the data has democracy. And we're seeing that now beginning to appear. And as that appears, we'll see a lot more changes in terms of access to digital by SMEs. Uh, at least it gives them more opportunity to be at the same starting line uh, when it comes to new opportunities to seize the power of, of, of digital. We're seeing this in many different um, use cases, is beginning to appear. Uh, ADB just launched its uh, big uh, challenge on um, uh, women um, and their access to micro credit in Pakistan. And they're looking at how you can share your data. So a person who has data, let's say, uh, their interaction with Lazada or their interaction with Shopee and their interaction on Facebook and their interaction, they own that data. They collect that data and make it available to a few micro lenders, and voila, you have, you have something going there. You have something going there. So a lot of these opportunities we're beginning to see on the back of data, more than digital platform that I was thinking in the past uh, X number of years. 
That's very interesting. I remember a, 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 a case, and you've raised the gender issue that I promised we would get to. I mean, I remember we were evaluating a World Bank microcredit program for women in Pakistan, and we had the unfortunately nasty finding that many of the companies that we thought were women-owned companies were actually run by the men, and they were using the women as, as fronts for getting the money. And, and what, what unfortunately, the women were the ones who were on the hook for the repayment obligations. And, how do, and so with the situation you're describing, are, when we're using social media and things, is, are, we, are we more or less likely to fall into that sort of trap, which came in, I should say, that came in the analog era of all this, where you know, people physically came up to the microcredit institution and made a paper application in those days. Where we are today in terms of data, data also means data about yourself, about your facial recognition. There are so many other areas in terms of data that can feed and allow that um, uh, sort of integrity of data and transparency that allows the micro lenders to, to run their scoring and, 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 and their programs and match them. This is new. This is, this is all new. We're just seeing the start of that. And I would, I would see a lot of startups, local startups, uh, resolving these local issues using um, data in almost this web 3.0 paradigm uh, to support SMEs. But, and I'm not just asking you this, Shinjini, because you're a woman, but you know, is, it, is it just the case that all this is going to resolve in time? I mean, is there something else going on? Why in the last iteration of Findex did we not see, despite a lot of digital innovation that's taken place in the last four or five years, why are we not seeing the gender gap close? Sure. So, Matt, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the gender gap, but I, I actually wanted to add a little point to what Vazir was talking about because he brought us to that point, but I think there is something there that we need to talk a little bit more about, which answers this question, which is on the screen. If you don't mind, I'll just yeah, read please, that uh, out. Please read it. So, that uh, so, there's a question here which says, SMEs may lack expertise and resource to innovate or move to digital. How can they overcome this in order to implement the change? And uh, I... Where you left off, I wanted to actually ask you a question, Vizier, that um, uh, yes, it is true that so far, digitization has actually led us to create very large platforms. And uh, even though there have been benefits of it to various people and population groups, there have also been this asymmetry created where a large amount of power resides with a small group of people, right? Because they are the providers of the platform, they can dictate terms. One of the things that is an universal experience now is that if I'm a small business, which I am today, or if I was a big business, which I was when I was at Citibank, if I want to go on Instagram or Facebook, and I'm taking names because it's okay, to go and acquire consumers, right? There is a, there's a toll that I pay, and I'm not in control of how that algorithm works for me, even though I may have the data, right? So this whole paradigm shift from this way of doing digital to the Web3 way of doing, doing digital, which probably can give us a little bit more ability and distribution of that power. And I wanted to hear your views on that because I'm really not the expert. I just have this very interesting anecdote from London uh, from being in UK last time, where uh, you realize that uh, in addition to the Uber, there are very small local taxi groups which are on WhatsApp and some local person will give you that WhatsApp group and they will be very good taxi drivers and you can just run your life on the basis of one after the other. You never really need to go to Uber. I mean, I, I just saw that and I found that very interesting. So I wanted to hear your views on that, Vazir, and how do you see that change? Right, let's take that very example, the Uber example, right? So in Web 3.0, you will have individuals who deal with maybe 100 Uber or ride providers, and those 100 ride providers may have 100 customers. The matching of them, so you have 100 on this side, 100 on this side, and then you have an ecosystem of many people having um, their own customers, their own riders, and it's all supported decentrally without a middle sort of gigantic machinery of a platform. And that will, you know, that, that world is coming. That world is coming. Now, how will, you know, which area is going to disrupt uh, where it will support, but in many cases, it does bring the centralized power away. So there is that, 
let go that needs to happen uh, that's today in centralization. Th that I, I personally believe uh, quite firmly. That that's really interesting. And, and we, we just got another really interesting question that came in which says, uh, with all the micro lending and SME lending that's out there, and, and certainly there's a lot of publicity for, for micro microfinance in particular over the past years, plus um, you, you'll never find a banker that isn't going to tell you publicly that SMEs are really important to the bank. So despite all that, I'm <laughs> embellishing this question, why do you think that the SME gap is still huge? I mean, we, the SME gap that we estimate in the SME Finance Forum is 5.2 trillion for formal MSMEs around the world alone and close to 10 trillion if you add the informal sector. And we're about to redo that estimate and I promise you it's not going to go down because of COVID and things. So watch the space, but don't be optimistic that that gap is closing. So what do you think, Sandeep? Why, why despite all we're hearing, we know all these institutions say how important SMEs are. Why are they not getting better access to finance? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's just the availability and the access to the data because the data sits in a particular ecosystem. It's not grown, gone cross-network, cross-ecosystem. And that's what this technology is enabling. And yes, decentralized will do it someday. You still need the centralized entities to provide trust and identity and basically some kind of a scoring. I think so that gap is primarily because of the localization of the data because the persona is only limited to that ecosystem. And SME is also bank or cash and receivable and other activities they do. They have a phone, they pay the taxes on, you know, uh, to the government, but those are not connected. So how do you connect that? And there are efforts going on and where there are efforts going on where there is a national identity service which actually ties the persona into different ecosystem together, the SME gap is reducing. You know, whether you take it in the developed economies where you have a social security number or a national ID number, I think you can tie these persona and then tie that data together. So and the technology now is able to harness that data also because pentabyte or petabytes of data which is available, how do you actually identify that data? Sometimes too much data is also bad. It's like finding a hay needle in a stack so you're saying there is technology available which will then crunch that data into meaningful thing which basically says, is there a propensity to repay? If there is a propensity to repay, that's called scoring, and then that gap will basically reduce. And that's what the technology guys are doing. We are doing that and obviously can't do it alone, so we work with public institutions and other private institutions to bring it to life. But you're raising a very interesting point that you start with the bedrock of I need to be able to make sure I know who you really are. Yeah. And so if you have a good ID system for both individuals and ideally also for companies. Unfortunately, all too few countries, even with India's Aadhaar, there's still not a corporate level ID that's, that's embraced. And despite the legal entity identifier also that's now spreading around the world. But even then, as you were saying, you need, you need the data. If all my different digital relationships are in different pockets, the cost of, I still have that problem of the cost of getting it all together is too high. So, you know, do you think, Someone like MasterCard, who might be the, the connector for much of it, Ob obviously not all, because you're, you're the rails, if you will, for the payments. How do we get, how do we create those common pools that both make this available in an aggregated form at an affordable cost, but also ideally keep the SME in control? Because after all, this data is the SME's data, right? It shouldn't be ours as a, as a financier or, or the big companies as a buyer or seller, right? It should belong to the SME, but how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, so, so one is, one is if, you, if, if you go one step back, the corporate delinquency is much higher, right? This is when you know the corporates, when you know what they're doing, the amount of corporate delinquency on a loan is much higher than what an SME is, right? The one who's more needful. So, so if you bring it back to the SME, which is a larger set, you basically again take you don't need to import all the data and ingest all the data within into your own data repository, but you basically take the specialist and basically take transaction level data and, and I let those ecosystems score that and combine that with your own score is what you need. You don't need the whole universe of data and you score on that. You say, here is a bit on the ability to pay in your daily utilities, your everyday life, your monthly bills, entertainment, and you combine these different snippets and then weight that and then allow, allow that to happen. 
then you can do that. Now, could we, could we, could we do that ourselves? So yes, we can do that through financial institutions uh, and, and the other entities we work with, but we will bring in the technology like machine learning, like artificial intelligence, which we are slightly ahead on, and also apply the reverse of fraud, where bad data is fraud, good data is loyalty. So you send that. Now, is that a technology running on a blockchain or not a blockchain or Web3 where you only give access to certain pieces of data and other pieces are not available? And when you get access to that data, you get incentivized for that in form of credit or whatever. But we're saying, yes, first is the technology didn't exist, the technology providers didn't exist, and then the data sources were really isolated. Yes, we can bring in as a private institution the technology of good and bad data and score on that but you can apply individual scores at the ecosystem level and aggregate that and then basically the financial institutions or the non financial the non banking financial you know lenders can actually do the lending part so in in some ways you're saying that payments which we used to see as the the core to this is actually becoming more of a just a necessary utility and what's really critical is creating this analytic capacity and moving if you will from being a plastic card company to being a data analytics and informatics company. So it's a profound move for a MasterCard and it's also a profound move for those that are trying to create the ecosystems in countries. And there's a, I knew this would come at some point and there's gonna, I think there's gonna be a session later on embedded finance, but let me go back to you, Nitin. So th the question is about using data for embedded finance and um, <clears throat> you know, data integrity is important. What and how can be done Oops, it just disappeared, and I didn't do that, so don't blame me. But I think it's, how do we make embedded finance more possible? And just to, to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, because I always worry about terms that everybody uses and that no one really knows what they mean. We're talking about a situation where, let's say, in the case of Adani, that I'm a supplier to Adani, and I'm on a platform which Adani uses to track you know, what their procurement and that I've agreed to provide that and that I get it on time. Now embedded finance is if I then say, well, I need some working capital, and instead of having to go to a bank or a different process, that same platform can suddenly say, oh, do you need some extra financing to make this order happen? And I click on that and I, so what about the data integrity issue there? How do you deal with that? So uh, it's, a, it's a very wise question, uh, Matt. So we do have an arm called Adani Capital, where we uh, support and sponsor small businesses. So, Let's say somebody is supplying a lot of goods to us and having a good track record. Then, of course, giving him a credit line is one thing. We, we do that. But if we see that there is a performance, he is actually, we have three suppliers and he's actually doing a great job compared to other suppliers, two suppliers. Then we actually fund that guy for more and more business. And we, we put the money, we increase the order size, and we use that data. But that data... And is that all in a single interface? I mean, do you have to... Because so embedded would mean, ideally, that you're staying in the same interface on the screen, so we, and you're just clicking the button, and it still looks like you're in the same place, but you're adding the financing, so right? Not, not, not really, uh, because there are, uh, it's a combination of two, three systems, but they talk to each other. We do get the intelligence of the performance, and we do give the finance. There is a... Uh, it's an omni-channel, so it's offline plus online but the finance enablement is happening. So it's semi-embedded. Yeah. So but, it's, but you have a lot of confidence in the data to get at the integrity up. question because you know the guys that are providing you with the data and you know they wouldn't sell you a bill of goods, yeah. so, so to speak. So <laughs> the data gets uh, used by either the provider or us. Right. So we don't give it to any third party. That's, that's absolutely given. So we, there is no monetization model on that. But here I'd like to take a step back. I would like to add what uh, Sandeep has said. On SME side, it's a private and public partnership which needs to come together. Because right now there is no central data lake for, the, for a first time business, right? If I'm entering into business first time, if I'm a woman en entrepreneur who's actually doing a cake business and saying that, okay, this is I'm doing first time and there is no data, there is no track record. We need to solve that issue. Being a corporate, being a national scheme, being an NGO, I don't know, but there is a bigger handshake needs to happen. For 170 million SMEs which are in Southeast Asia, which are growing 20% year on year, 
that for 20% to take it to 50% growth, I think that's what is more required. That's where I think uh, all of us, including the government, needs to come together and say that how can we enable it. And some of my panelists have said that, uh, I think Sandeep only said that, the bad debts on the loans are actually at a corporate level and not at a SME level, right? And I can validate from at least our sector of business that 98% partners, they don't default, in neither in financing nor in product and service. Mm -hmm. It's it's a absolutely correct number with a validation. But how, to get at another question here from our very wise audience, um, why, how do you still ensure, just, it, you were saying, for example, that women, are, they're often less involved in these digital systems, and so there's less information about them. How do we ensure that data is used appropriately uh, so that, and I'm going to twist this question a little bit from what I don't know if the, if the person asking was intending this, but since there's already an intrinsic bias that we know from statistics against women-run enterprises, how do we make sure that as we have more data, it actually helps us to close and address that unconscious bias rather than intensify and accelerate the bias? Because after all, an algorithm doesn't, it's not an ethical creature. Right, Does, who wants to, you want to have a so go person, So I think it's the segmentation and persona, what Sandeep also touched upon, right? So for example, if we are coming from a region, we are one type of business and we have our data, then at least there is a predictive modeling. We can say that this type of loan is a little safer, this type of business loan and this ticket size is a little safer for one time transaction for the second time business. I think there is a lot can be done, but it has to be centralized. It can't be, uh, you know, with one corporate or a one player. There has to be a pool which is combinedly owned. So Sandeep? a lot of push for the coordination. Yes, please. Uh, so I, I want to add to this uh, existing conversation. And uh, so essentially the credit underwriting uh, that it has existed for a long time, right? And the bureaus have existed for a long time and the bureaus have data and the bureaus are also trying to improve and stretch their data. I think a lot of new data like what you talked about is coming in, analytics is coming in, a lot of fintechs are building layers on top of that to expand that data ecosystem. I think problems that continue to remain in this uh, space of SMEs is coming from two sources. One is that the cost of distribution and collection continues to be not something which is viable for that massive scale up to happen. So that's still uh, something and that's where embedded finance may help, that's where fintech may help, but it is a story that is still being written. It is not a story where we know the end of this story. Okay, So that's one factor that's important. The second factor which I think we sometimes lose sight of is the nature of the economy itself. So the nature of the economy itself has fragmented so that there are few large businesses that keep getting larger and larger and there is a lot of fragmentation at the bottom. So the tail end keeps getting longer and longer so much so that at the at a very end of that tail it is a very long tail of just peer to peer transactions. So it's like you know just as an individual doing something. And I think that is a trend that is going to keep accelerating because the lifestyle choices and the earning choices that young people are making are not the same that we were making. So my father would have found it uh, blasphemy to not work in the same job for 50 years. I probably worked for whatever, 30 years. My, uh, our kids don't think like that, right? They all want jobs that are a combination of job and you know break and job and break. And the reason that we started to build for women is because that's the life that women have lived forever breaks between jobs, small earnings, fragmented sources of earning, and low asset ownership, and therefore you can't get a loan. You think about a millennial or a Gen Z, that's exactly the problem that that person is going to deal with vis-a-vis -vis the banking system. Banking system has not changed its algorithm to underwrite credit. These people have changed their lifestyle. There is a whole section in between that is getting built, and it's very encouraging that the rails to build that are available. The rails to build that are the mobile, the data, the, you know, what you talked about, tokenization. Uh, that uh, In India, we are building something called, uh, um, what is that? Uh, uh, so so you, ha you're, you have a system wherein you can actually release your data with consent, a consent yeah. architecture. Uh, so all of those things will happen. But as I said, it's a story being scripted. This idea of the very long tail of NBFC, uh, of, of uh, credit uh, worthy, uh, SMEs and micro entrepreneurs is not going to be solved 
uh, I think at least in my lifetime, because the tail will keep getting longer. That's, that's where we are living. So that's if a, I was re to that's a really it. interesting point. Go ahead, Sandeep. So if I was, it's a good problem to have. There was no data before. It was all cash, right? This is a very cash-driven region of the world. So people went on trust, and your neighbors will tell you if you can pay or not repay, right? So now there is a data issue, which is a good problem, because then you act on the data, and then you extend credit. Then, then we're saying, OK, so what's our company's philosophy? We're saying, as a consumer or an SME, you own the data, you control the data, we just facilitate the movement of that data, right? So very clean on that. And if all the other companies adopt that kind of a principle, then you're saying, OK, it's not used for any other reason than it's intended for. Right? That's, that's the, the general. Yeah. The so, general but we have, so what you're saying, and we're, we're, I could continue this discussion with you all forever. There will, we're going to be on this topic, though, the whole afternoon, so you guys should stick around. And by the way, we're going to hear from Africa later, and I'll be back with you with a panel from Africa about the great opportunities happening there, having talked about Asia here. But so the key is that there is more and more data, but we have to make sure it can be together. And, and as you said, Shinjini, there's also, because the way of work, the whole attitude toward work, that having one thing as opposed to having a bunch of side hustles you put together, all this is changing. All the more reason we need to be able to capture the data, make it easy both to share it for the people that are serving the SMEs, but also make it easy for the SMEs to understand how it all adds together. And then we have to have that governance system, as you're saying, where, where we're creating a way that that data can be used responsibly, that we're allowing competitive access to it, but with clear consent from the, the yeah. customer, as you're saying, and, and, and that we can, so that if you are demonstrating good character, good, good intent, which is what another question that we didn't get to is about, that can be seen through all these patterns that emerge, but only if you have all the data and you can put it all together. So Matt, actually, there is a very interesting program in India on the banking, so consent, it's a consent driven. So if you need a loan, you need to go to the bank, give your statements and everything. Right now it's a centrally government controlled program where you give consent, the bank will automatically fetch your statements and uh, banking records and, and the Sibyl and everything for a duration of time and use it for that particular use case and is done. It's a national level program done fantastically well. Well, so thanks. So, and, and as you're saying, you know, the authorities, and we're going to have authorities here in a minute. We're in our last minute of this panel, by the way. Authorities are, they play a key role in this because they yeah. determine without their help, Absolutely. it's hard to see how these markets would naturally structure. Yeah. Now that's not to say that there isn't immense room for private initiative as all of you are demonstrating. And, and, and I hope this has been a real kickoff to all the potential of things that can happen to get more and more businesses into more and more opportunities and also hopefully to address this gender gap which is stubbornly, despite all, despite all the digital technology we have, is still resisting its closing. So with that, let's give a big hand to our panel and they've given us a great kickoff to this session. And stick around, there's lots more to come. We're going to turn back to our MC.